The Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'm Dean Ash from Guthrie, Oklahoma. We call ourselves Garden Angelus because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we want you to love it too. Yes, we do. We are also authors and invite you to check out our books, including my books, Potted and Pruned, Homegrown and Handpicked, and Seeded and Sodded, my trilogy of gardening humor, and my newest book, Creatures and Critters, Who's in My Garden? And my book, I Only Have One. The 2030-something Garden Guide, a no-fuss, down-and-dirty gardening 101 for anyone who wants to grow stuff. You can ask for any of our books at your favorite bookstore or find them online wherever books are sold. And speaking of online, you can also find us as The Garden Angelist on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. And we'd love for you to join our Facebook group, The Garden Angelist Garden Club. Now on to this week's episode. Hello, Dee. Hello, Carol. How's the quarantine where you live? Uh, pretty much the same as always because it's just me here and I just don't go anywhere. Right? I went to the grocery store yesterday. We'll just quickly talk about that. There was nothing on the shelf. My mom has so far this week, now bear in mind, everybody, my mom lives in assisted living, but my mom has requested so far this week one item per day. And so they're all, they're all really quarantined to their rooms. So she doesn't really know what's going on. And she was like, I heard I need hand sanitizer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and yesterday she was like, I need some bread. I'd like the health nut kind. Cause you know, that's my favorite. <laughs> and I just sit her back. <laughs> I sent her back pictures of the grocery store, which showed the bread aisle empty, the eggs empty, the meat empty, everything empty. And I said, I, no, there's no bread, Mom. She also wanted peanut butter. But anyway, back to our show. Well, I'm, I'm pretty well set here, and I think uh, we are in Indiana shut down for two weeks. So um, I'm just going to keep working on my YouTube channel, Indie Gardener, and see yeah. how that goes. <laughs> yeah, you've been putting up some YouTube videos. Right. I've been babysitting. Yes, and the weather's getting better, so I'm going to go out and plant Two flats of the flower we're going to talk about today. So you want to do the quote or do you want me to do the quote? The fragrance of flowers spreads only in the direction of the wind, but the goodness of a person spreads in all directions by Chanakaya, which yes. we've talked about before. Right. And I love that quote because it is true. Get downwind of those uh, flowers and you can smell them. And there's a lot of goodness going on in the world today with people helping other people. There is. And let me just point out about my mom. She gets three square meals a day, so she's okay. Yeah. They're feeding her. Right. I'm, not, I'm not being cruel. She just loves peanut butter, and I, she doesn't understand why she can't find Jif. But anyway. Anyway. So the, the flower today. Today is alyssum. Alyssum. Which pr- grows pretty well in Indiana, but I hear it struggles in Oklahoma. It does struggle in Oklahoma, even though they sell it. Every year at the beginning of spring. In fact, if you could go to a nursery today, which they may still be open right now, um, you would find that they would have alyssum there both in the purple and in the white. Um, They do struggle here, though, but they're really pretty in spring, and they smell really good, and pollinators love them. Yes, and here in Indiana, they do pretty well. If we have a really, really hot summer, they'll struggle but I find that if I plant them along the edge of the vegetable garden and they get adequate water, they tend to struggle along through the summer and then they kind of revive in the fall. And it's very nice. And Proven Winters has some varieties that are supposed to be an improvement over the ones that, you know, have been out there for years. And we looked those up. Yeah, there's Snow Princess, Dark Knight, Blushing Princess, White Knight. And so they... Like you said, they range in color from white through light purple through dark purple. And mm-hmm. I find with the proven winter varieties that you get a tiny bit bigger flower because alyssum in and of itself is a tiny flower. So the bigger flowers are kind of nice. And you can start them pretty early where you live, right? Before um, frost is actually over with, right? That is correct. And I actually ran down to the greenhouse uh, last week when they thought that they might have to shut down. Bought two flats of alyssum, and they're on the front porch. And I think today it'll finally be nice enough, and I'll go out and plant those. I'm going to tuck them in a couple of pots of violas that I have and then put some in the vegetable garden. 
That's awesome. Uh, I will not be buying any this year. I used to grow it when I was young, but I think our summers during that part of my life were not as hot. But, uh, you know, anyway, they don't do so well here now. And so we actually looked up on Proven Winners website some of the stuff that they require. Um, it says that they don't want wet feet, and they don't because they will rot. But here I don't think you can get their feet wet enough, although it has been raining here almost constantly. So there might be a problem right now. I don't know. They need good drainage. Yeah, they like good drainage. Good drainage. Don't we all like good drainage? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, remember we talked about watercress a couple of weeks ago? Yep. And it actually grows in water. And Dee, I took on your challenge. I've got seeds in there to plant for watercress. I think you're crazy, but that's cool. You do that. Okay. All I right. guess I could grow it in my pond, but... I don't know if I'd want to eat it after my pond. No. After my pond. That would be gross. So alyssum is in the Brassicaceae family. Yeah, I'm glad you said that instead of me. I'm going to have to teach you Brassicaceae, which is the cabbage and broccoli family. Brassicaceae. Smarty pants. Very good. Thanks. So that's very, why it doesn't do good. well in Oklahoma. Because right. it's part of the cabbage family. And although you can grow cabbage in Oklahoma, you want to do it really, really early. And also you want to do it in the fall. So maybe if we all bought seeds for our sweet alyssum, put them in the fall, you know, grow them in the house and then put them in the fall. No, that's too much trouble and I'm lazy. So forget it. Forget it. Forget it. Forget it. But they do like a little bit of a windy spot, it says. They like to get a breeze going through them and that good air circulation because they kind of have a dense foliage. So that just kind of helps them stay healthy because sometimes if you get them too wet and there's not good air movement, they kind of rot from the center. It's nasty. They get kind of mildewy or something. Yes, yes. and it's gross. Nobody likes it. Um, we're, if you're really, gonna grow, huh? we're really making them sound great. And I do love alyssum. They have a sweet scent. They right. attract pollinators. They kind of blend in and sort of tie other flowers together. So I, I like I.e. Them. they're a filler. Oh, fancy words at me, D. Filler. <laughs> they're a filler. So they like the sun, unless they're in Oklahoma where it gets too hot. But you also, they like a good feeding. They're very, very heavy feeders because they produce a lot of flowers. Yes. And I find that if you buy name varieties like the Proven Winners, you'll actually get a little tiny bit bigger flower. And when I say a tiny bit bigger flower, I'm still talking about a tiny flower. Right. It's a small flower, but a lot of them. So great plant for pollinators. Great to grow if you live north. And fun here if you just want something for early spring. True that. Or fall. So when this podcast is over, if the weather becomes better, I will be planting two flats worth here and there and everywhere. I'll be planting pansies at my church. Very nice. I love pansies, as we all know. Me too. And violas. Okay. So what do you want to talk about next, D? Our veggie? Our veggie. Our well, and you have a quote, so go for it. The best fertilizer for a piece of land is the footprints of its owner by Lyndon Baines Johnson. I think it's funny that Lyndon Baines Johnson was actually talking about fertilizer for land and footprints. Do you think he grew a lot of things? He, I don't know. He had a big ranch, but his... His wife, Lady Bird Johnson, was very into the wildflowers and was instrumental in a lot of the wildflower plantings along the highways and byways. Right. And there's the big Johnson, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in Austin, Texas, that you and I have both visited. Many times. Many, I've many times. Seen. And you know what? Sometimes. They have a really, really, really good website for looking up wildflowers and not just those that are indigenous to Texas. Look at me throwing out the big words, indigenous, um, native to Texas, but wildflowers all over the United States. So it's a great resource as well. Right, because not every wildflower started in Texas. They started in different areas because they didn't know what state they were in. Um, she's a wonderful example, and I think next week we need a quote from Lady Bird because it's Women's History Month. You know what? I'm making a note of that, D. So I'm going to find you a Lady Bird Johnson quote. She cared about wildflowers before anybody else did, but we're not talking about wildflowers now. We're talking about our veggies. 
Well, and the reason I picked that quote, Dee, is because it mentioned fertilizer. And I like it. We had a listener who asked us to talk about when you start seeds indoors, what do you do for fertilizing? Um, yes, we did. Okay, so we're going to talk about the seeds we've started and our transplants and whether we fertilize them. So the answer is, yes, we have started seeds. And yes, I do fertilize once I see true leaves, but I cut it back pretty severely. So it is a very, very, very diluted fertilizing. And you don't fertilize, D? I don't fertilize my transplants. Um, they seem to grow just fine in the potting soil I use. And um, I've never had trouble with that. I mean, if I saw yellow leaves and they looked unhealthy, um, yes, I might fertilize a little bit. And there was some talk on Instagram, and I'm trying to remember who I was talking to. It was one of my favorite, one of my favorite people who she starts a lot of veggie stuff. And I think her, yeah, her handle on there is seed to fork. Anyway, we were talking about it because some of her transplants looked yellow and she, she grows a lot more transplants than I do. And she, we were discussing it and she was asking people what they thought. And she's trying out some core mixtures of potting soil you know, to have less. Right. Uh, less peat. Moss, right. Because there's, right. Because quar is a renewable resource. Um, I, I think that, and I, when I've used quar stuff before, it did seem to, I, I had some more yellowing. So we discussed that and discussed whether those might need a slight liquid fertilizer boost. And I don't know what she decided to do, but I thought that was very interesting. That is interesting. And when I, and I look at the instructions and I try to buy a good organic fertilizer and it's a little tricky because my seedlings are indoors and some organic fertilizer, let's just face it, have a little bit of an odor to them. Yes. Fish but, emulsion. Yeah. But so it says to, you know, for seedlings, you definitely want to dilute it. And they sometimes mm -hmm. say half and I'll sometimes go with a fourth because I just. Yeah, I would go with a fourth. <laughs> I don't want to end up um, killing the things with too much fertilizer. Cause and that's very easy to do because they are not set up for the plant in its seed has all it's, it, you know, it's an embryo. So it has all it needs to grow at first. And it would be after it gets its leaves that it would need some fertilizer if it's showing some distress, but you got to really watch plants cause you can overdo it. Right. Especially if you um, decide to use, uh, we'll call it the, the blue formula. Which, yeah, don't do that. Though that's such a high salt concentration, you could end up, um, it could be a bad thing. It could be a bad thing, and you don't need it anyway. So if you're going to do it, we just suggest um, a very diluted form of fertilizer. And so some people use compost teas and manure teas, and I have used manure tea before um, because it is very diluted, and you can do that if you want to. I honestly I just don't have that much trouble. But I'll say this. My potting soil is organic, and it has a low content of fertilizer within the potting soil. Yeah. So that's probably why I don't need to do it. Exactly. If the, fer if the potting soil you're using came with fertilizer mixed in, you absolutely do not need to add additional fertilizer at that stage. And seed starting soil does not have fertilizer in it, not that any that I know of. I just don't use it because it's so fine that it floats and it kind of drives me crazy. Yeah. I just use what I have on hand. Well, and I used some seed starting mix this time, Dee, because um, I didn't want to go to the store and I had a bag and a half from previous years, so I'm reusing what I have. Good for you. And I saw that on your on one of your, what do you call those things, YouTube videos? Yes, one of my YouTube videos. Yeah. So there's no more fun then sowing seeds and growing your own plants. Right. And that leads us right into our bookshelf. Well, we have two things we have to talk about with growing seedlings. Oh, I thought we were done. No, we got two more oh. things we got to talk oh, about. Oh, we have to Dave. talk about hardening off and damping off. Okay. Yeah. So I'll take hardening off. Hardening off is the process where you take your seedlings, your transplants, not seedlings. They should be bigger than that size. You take your transplants in and out, in and out doors. Okay. In Oklahoma, I don't know what you do in Indiana, I never, ever put these in full sun outside. No. I harden off mine in the shade. Is that Absolutely. what you do? Yes. You need to put them out in the shade for a little bit and then bring them back in at night. You don't want them to get too cold. You definitely don't want them to be in full sun. You'll find them crispy. Um, and just gradually acclimate them. And one thing that helps them grow stronger is, believe it or not, is 
I think the wind action kind of moves the stems back and forth, yeah. and that strengthens them. Right. So right. sometimes with my tomato and pepper seedlings inside, I'll run my hand gently across them and kind of simulate that a couple of times a day, like petting them. Okay, that's funny because in Oklahoma, the wind is fierce in the spring because of the spring storms. Um, and, you know, even when we don't get the rain, we get all the wind that comes with those storms. So I never, ever have to worry about running my hands across the seedlings because the wind does it for me. It does also dry out your plants some, which is not a bad thing as long as you water them. And so when I put my transplants outside, I give them a good watering because I know they're going to be blown about by the wind. Right. And then, so you want me to talk about damping off? You yeah, want... you go ahead. I don't like, uh, I don't like that topic. No, it's, uh, it's very sad. I laugh. <laughs> <laughs> it's very sad. But it's a bacterial disease that kills the seedlings. And there is no cure except to start over with clean trays, clean soil, or fresh soil and new seeds. And basically, if you're come, come into your sunroom or your greenhouse or wherever you're growing them, and they're flopped over and all you know, mushy at the base, that's damping off. It's sad. And you, and you got to use a 10% bleach solution if you're going to reuse trays. Right. Um, and people don't do that sometimes, and that's when they get damping off. Or if you don't use sterile potting soil, like I, I actually have people sometimes ask me about using soil from the garden. Never use soil from the garden to start seeds unless you're starting them directly outside. And the reason for that is, it doesn't drain well enough, and also it has a lot of bacteria in it, which is great when you're growing outside, not so great when you're growing inside. Right. And so air movement helps, and so some people will set up like a, a fan to blow over their seedlings to kind of keep the air moving. I've, I've heard that being done. I personally haven't done that. But the, the trick is you have them covered until they germinate, but the minute they germinate, take that cover off because they cannot – that. That will uh, that'll kill them. That will less. <laughs> that will make it less of an environment for damping off if it's good airflow. That's what I was trying to say. Blah 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 blah. Plus, it's hot underneath that cover, and that's not. That's going to stress out your seedlings. So, I have some out in the greenhouse that I've been um, doing this year because some years I start a lot of seeds indoors, but I have this new grandbaby, so. I've been a little busy, and so I've started some out in my greenhouse this year, and they're doing great. I decided to start my amaranth indoors instead of just planting it directly outside. Do you want to know why? I do want to know why. Because I have this idea that I want this river of amaranth in my bed that faces the street. And in order to create the river the way I want it to, I need to have individual plants to put, you know, in the soil. Normally, I just put amaranth outside because it'll grow easily. But we'll see what happens. I mean, we'll see if it transplants well. And I mean, I know it I know it will, as long as I do it right. Right. And I have started 16 varieties of tomatoes, nine varieties of peppers, and three varieties of eggplant. I thought you bought most of your tomatoes and peppers and eggplant. I do, but the other day, uh, I decided to sort through all my old seed stash, and I came uh -huh. up with seeds, and anything that was from 2018, 2019, or this year, I decided to go ahead and start those seeds. Where are you going to put all those? Well, before you get too all like, what? I only <laughs> planted two cells of each variety. And you might lose one because even if you're an expert seed starter, sometimes you lose stuff. Right. And I sowed them. Uh, the older the seed was, the more I sowed in that. So either nothing's coming up or a bunch are coming up. And then I'll just um, cut it back to just have one seedling in there. But you know what I found, D? I found potato seeds. What? Really? Yes. So <laughs> okay. our, our friends at All America Selections, and maybe it was in 2018, they actually sent us I remember seeds this. Yeah. for potatoes that you can grow from seed. And so there are no instructions on that packet. But I, I went ahead and sowed two little cells, and I, I, I don't know. I just thought... <laughs> Never grown potatoes from seed. I'll give it a whirl. This is really kind of unusual for you because you're not the adventurous one of this duo. Usually it's me starting tons of weird stuff and you're like, okay, that's just weird. I'm going to go buy, 
you know, better boy or whatever. Well, so this will be fun to see. <laughs> it will be. And I've grown seedlings in the past. It just, it's sort of one of those things. It's cyc- cyclical. Some years, yes. Right. Some years, no. This is a yes year. I mean, I had to go through all the seeds anyway, which I, by the way, I put all that on YouTube, Sorting Seeds with Carol. Nice. Fascinating. Nice. Eight, eight episodes. So it can be binge watched. <laughs> okay. I, I love you, Carol, but I'm not binge watching the YouTube. Um, videos. I'm not doing that. What? Okay. So <laughs> no, I'm not, I know I had to laugh because I was thinking about Bernie Sanders calling it the YouTube and I was going to actually say the YouTube videos. And then I said the YouTube. So maybe that's what I'm to Bernie Sanders. Anyway, we are digressing, but I started one, two, three, I think three varieties of tomato. Cause I'm going to buy most of mine up in Tulsa. The Tulsa master gardeners, um, canceled their sale, by the way. Most- they could not figure out how to do it with yeah. yeah. And it's in April. Oh, well. But I think I think I really want to buy them from the tomato man's daughter because I want to support her. And then I also started two varieties of pepper. One was confetti because I love the variegated leaves and it's a really pretty pepper and it's good. And I might have started Mad Hatter again because I really like Mad Hatter. And plus we got some seeds from All-American Selections from the National Garden Bureau and I think I started a pepper of those and a couple of eggplant. That's it. That's quite a bit. I will buy Not I really. will buy plants from the local greenhouse when the shutdown of Indiana is over. She'll be her greenhouses will be packed because they've been planting because they already have everything. So man, I'm gonna be over there buying a bunch of stuff this spring. Okay. Sounds fun. So let's go to the bookshelf. So we were talking about there's no greater joy than sowing seeds and how to grow your own plants. And on our bookshelf this week is Mastering the Art of Flower Gardening by Matt Mattis. Last year he wrote Mastering the Art of Vegetable Gardening, which we loved. And so now he's come out with a flower gardening book because he does both, which he goes into great detail about in his introduction. Because I guess his brother thought that he only grew flowers. Um. He does put an emphasis on his blog on flowers, but I knew he grew both, and I grow both. I just like flowers, too. Right. So he grows a huge variety of flowers. He's a plantsman and a plant collector. He grows things that I don't even know what he's talking about sometimes, but it's fun to read it. And then he loves rare flower varieties. But in this book, he doesn't just focus on the rare ones. Which is good. That's very good. Um, my only caveat is that some of the flowers that he talks about will just not grow in my climate. So if you're a Southern gardener, keep that in mind, but that's not any reason not to buy the book because there's a lot of stuff in there that will grow. Just don't expect to be able to grow ranunculas and primroses here. Um, unless you like to be sad and you enjoy things like damping off. Well, and he lives over in Massachusetts. So I think most of what he's growing, I could grow in Indiana I was really excited, mm-hmm. Dee, that he included a chapter, and it's at the very end, on how to force Lily of the Valley pips into bloom in the wintertime. Because normally we've been buying those, but they didn't have them for sale last fall. So mm-hmm. I uh, hope to be able to dig up some of my own Lily of the Valley and force them this winter using his suggestions. Lily of the Valley is another tricky flower to grow in Oklahoma. My advice is if you know someone who has some of it, um, get a division from their plants because they're more acclimated. Acc- hmm, I can't say the word acclimated. They are more acclimated to our um, environment and climate. Um, that's what I did. And you need to grow them in the shade because they do best in the shade. And here in Oklahoma, I want to say they bloom in May, but I'm not sure. Well, and I, I was think about on Twitter last night. I noticed Matt made a tweet about sowing seedlings for Sarinth, which we're both growing, honeywort. Sarinthi? Sarinthi. Sarinth. Sarinthi. Yeah. Sarinth. Yes. You say Sarinth. Yeah. Anyway. Honeywort. Uh, I have the seeds for those that I bought from Renee's Gardens, and I'm going to – I did, couldn't decide, but I think I'm going to go ahead and sow those seeds inside now. And get those started. Mm-hmm. And I think I'm also going to go ahead and get some Nicotiana started because I have another flat that I can use. So, and another shop light to put them under. I still need to put mine in um, cells. So I'm glad you brought that up. So I'm going to start mine too. One of the things he mentions in the book about Serenthi is that 
It doesn't like to have its roots disturbed. So when we plant them outside, we need to be careful of that. Right. And I'll plant them in uh, peat pots. And then you can gently, I always take off that peat pot because a lot of times the roots really don't grow through it. I'll gently remove that and plop it right in the ground. It'll never know it got moved. There you go. Good deal. So anyway, that's Matt's book. It's The photographs are really beautiful. They are beautiful. And I some were taken of him um, sewing plants because I saw his tattoos. <laughs> and uh, he and I joke about tattoos because... I don't have any, but I ride motorcycles, so he says I probably should. And Anyway. Um, <laughs> and he has them, and he doesn't ride motorcycles? I don't know. I don't think he rides motorcycles. I don't think he does. So, anyway, let's move on to dirt. Yes, which is all about caring for gardening tools and the art of sharpening. Yes, it is an art. Yes, and I, I, I do attempt some sharpening. I have some old sharpening stones that I got from... The neighbor growing up, when they moved to a retirement home, I bought those off of him. And they're kind of hard to find. They're very hard to find. And I actually use a bench. I think it's a bench grinder is what I use to sharpen some of my tools. And I have to be careful. But, um, yeah, you I, know, some places, back in the day, you could get them sharpened almost anywhere. Because people shar- people sewed. And so there were scissor sharpener people. And hardware stores would sharpen your tools. So you could take them to the fabric store. Now we're dating ourselves. Right. The fabric store or to the hardware store, but nobody does it anymore that I know of. Not here. No, you have to find an old time hardware store and they're few and far between. And there's a master gardener group up on the North side and they've got a couple of guys that know how to sharpen tools. And so for a small donation, they'll sharpen tools during the meeting for people. So that's kind of nice. Um, I would love to hear from our local people that are on our Facebook group or people who listen to this podcast that are in Oklahoma, because if they know someone who sharpens tools locally, that would be awesome, because I actually also use my knife sharpener. Sometimes I take apart my pruners and sharpen them that way also. Right. The one thing about tools, too, is, and you know I got a lot of tools, you got to keep them clean. Yeah, you should. (laughs) I don't always, but you should. I don't either. (laughs) <laughs> One thing I did, I did figure out, you know, a couple of weeks ago when I was researching crazy ideas on the internet for gardening, and yes. I did, a lot of people think that a bleach solution should be used to clean off tools, like if you're out cutting things that are diseased. No. And that is, yeah, that's the, no, that's a big fat no, because that bleach can pit the metal and ruin the tools. Yeah, it would not be good for them at all. Um, And you have in here that a safer choice is a cleaner like Lysol, which I thought was interesting. Yes, and I got that. Linda Chalk, Professor Linda Chalker Scott, who we've talked about bef- before, who dispels myths all over the place. I found that on her website as when they did a bunch of tests and things. They found that Lysol and other household cleaners like that that do not have bleach in them were very effective. There you go. So another use for Lysol, which is a very old-fashioned cleaner. Yes. We're old-fashioned people, Dee. I guess we are. So that is pretty much our episode for today. We want to thank you for listening to The Garden Angelist. If you like our podcast, please tell your friends about us. And if you listen on Apple Podcasts, we'd love a five-star review. That helps us get noticed by others. Yes, and be sure and check out our show notes for links for more information about today's topic, plus links to our own websites. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the garden gate today. Bye until next week. Bye.